ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ومن يهده الله فلا مضل الله ومن يؤلل فلا هدي الله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك الله وأشهد أن محمد أبده رسوله Indeed, all the praise is due to Allah. We praise Allah. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil in our soul and from our sinful deeds. Those who are guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no one can misguide them. And those who are not guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no guide for them. I bear witness that there is no God, there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and messenger. O oh, you who believe, Revere Allah as Allah alone should be revered and die not except as Muslims. I'm bad. So when we talked about the three forms of shirk, you may remember that this was not taught in this method at the time of the Prophet ﷺ because they were there and before Islam had spread across many nations, it had, did not get contaminated or people's knowledge, I should say, did not get contaminated by other faiths creeping in, ideas of other faiths. So, inshallah, um, when we have Tawheed, we have its opposite, which is Shirk, which is the association or making partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, I spoke, started talking to you about the categories of shirk in the last class. And so today I want to continue in that. And I wanted to look a little bit more deeply into the shirk al asma wa safat. So for each tawheed, there is also a corresponding type of shirk. Okay? So in the shirk al asma wa safat, this category includes both the common pagan practice of giving Allah the attributes of Allah's creation as well as the act of giving created beings Allah's names and attributes. Shirk by humanization is when Allah is given the form and qualities of human beings and animals. Hopefully we're here. So let's talk a little bit about shirk by humanization. Due to man's superiority over animals, the human form is more commonly used by adulterers to represent God's creation. And that is supposed to be idolaters, <laughs> not adulterers. Uh, I did some uh, recording and yesterday I worked and uh, most of the day and so I didn't get a chance to check this. The image of the Creator is often printed, molded, or carved in the shape of human beings possessing the physical features of those who worship them. And I'm going to show you some pictures of actual, uh, actual examples of shirk by humanization. Hindus and Buddhists worship countless idols in the likeness of Asian men and consider the manifestation of God in creation. And so here are some, okay, are we not going to, I'm going to need you to, there we go, there we go. So this is um, an idea of that. So this is showing a god with hands. This is actually a goddess uh, with hands and, and human uh, features. So this would be shared by humanization. Of course, modern-day Christians believe that Prophet Jesus was God incarnate, that the Creator became his or her creation, is an example of shirk by humanization. So we know that Michelangelo painted in the Sistine Chapel pictures of God as a naked old European man with long flowing white hair and beard on the ceilings of the Sistine Chapel. And so here's some pictures of that for those of you who've never seen this. I have. And so here we can see, so what I find and when I have this conversation with people is that they'll often say, well, I don't, I don't, I don't see that. And yet it's everywhere. If you go to uh, many of the museums of the world or you go to some of the old basilicas, 
uh, you will find all kinds of drawings depicting Allah as a human or God as a human. This form of shirk and al asma wa safat relates to cases we are create, where we are creating beings or things are given or claim Allah's name or his or her attributes. It was the practice of ancient Arabs to worship idols whose names were derived from the names of Allah. Their main three idols were Alat, taken from Allah's name Al-Ilah, Al-Aziz, and Al-Manat, taken from Al-Manan. And so this is a picture of that. Um, and this was pre-Islamic Trinity, by the way. So a lot of people, when they talk about the word Trinity, and a lot of people came to Islam because they could not find the Trinity in the Bible that they would read, there was this ideology of Trinitarianism before Islam. And so if you read, for example, Bart Ehrman's book, and I believe it's entitled, When Did Jesus Become God? Or How Did Jesus Become God? The first chapter is all about the history of Trinitarianism, but not God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit Trinitarianism, but other deities and how this crept into Christianity after the third century, 325 AD to be exact. During the era of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, there was a false prophet in Arabia called Yamama. So you see, we didn't just start saying Yamama in latter days. There was a Yamama in uh, pre-Islamic time, when the time of Muhammad وسلم. The Nusariya, uh, which is a Shia site in Syria, believe that the Prophet Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law, Ali ibn Abi Talib, was a manifestation of Allah and gave him many of Allah's qualities. So many people are shocked to find that even within the sects of Islam, there is this shirk by deification or shirk by human, humanizing. There's another sect, and we have a lot of this sect actually in the Dr. Phillips area, and they are called the Ismailis. And they're also known as Aga Khanis. If you are familiar with this, raise your hand. Okay. Um, actually, there were some, quite some rifts in the state of Pakistan because they declared that these people are kuffar, that they are not among the Muslims. Okay. The Druze of Lebanon believed that the Fatimid Caliph Al-Hakam B. Amriya was the last manifestation of Allah among man mankind. Uh, also among the Sufis, just some orders, like Al-Hajjaj, that they have become one with God and as such exist as manifestations of the Creator within his or her creation, may also be included in this aspect of shirk by shirk al asma wa safat. So we really need to know this stuff because some people will make a blanket statement and they will say there's no shirk in Islam. Well, you're right. There's no shirk in Orthodox Islam. There's no shirk if you understand the Quran and the Sunnah. But there are sects that have been misled and they have deviated from this true meaning of shirk. And as we go on today and as you learn the brevity of this sin, you will understand why it is so important to know and understand this. And really and truly, when we see this, it should hurt our hearts. It, it, nothing should hurt the heart more than the idea or someone's actions that would associate themselves or an idea, I, sorry, an item that was created or a thing that was created with the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this should be the thing that breaks the heart of the Muslim the most. Modern day spiritualists and mediums such as Shirley MacLaine, this is a movie, I think the movie must be almost 35 or 40 years out, old, Out on a Limb, was a movie about her being a manifestation of God on earth. And she was a medium and she did a lot of work with the AIDS community when AIDS was uh, sort of just 
really being discovered. Um, also, Jay-Z Knight often obtained divinity uh, for themselves, claimed divinity for themselves um, as well. Uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, uh, C equals MC squared. Energy is equal to mass times the square of the speed of light. Taught in all schools is in fact an expression of Sheikh in al Asma wa Safat. Now who would ever think it? This is the subtlety of Sheikh. That it is in woven in so many things in the world that we are unaware of. And this is why we must have this consciousness of how the shaitan is always trying to delude us with thought. And as you look at this, I think it will become very clear to you. The theory states energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It merely transforms into matter and vice versa. Matter and energy are created entities and both of them will be destroyed. So we see in Surah 39 verse 62, Allah is the creator of all things. And the law is over all things, disposer of affairs. So keep in mind this proof. In Surah 55 and 26, everyone upon the earth will perish. Everything upon the earth will perish. Everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. So in the soul world, we're not going to have this physical body. We're going to be in another dimension. We came from another dimension, the soul world, and Allah's ruh breathed that into our mother's womb at about 120 days into gestation. And then we were put on this physical plane for a marathon of 70 or 80 years, according to however long we live, of test. And then we will return to Allah in a different form. And we will go back to the alam al ghaib the unseen world, which we came from. The theory also implies that mass and energy are eternal, having no beginning or end, since they are supposed to be uncreated and transformed into each other. Well, what do we know? The only thing in the reality that is eternal is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, we will have eternal life, but it changes dimensions. We will either have eternal life in heaven or hell. But our physical life, this dimension, is not eternal. It's the spiritual dimension. This attribute belongs only to Allah, who alone is without beginning or end. So whenever you, the young folks that are doing their masters, their bachelors, their masters and PhD programs, these are great arguments to present to a professor. When you are talking to an intellect who is an atheist, this is a great way to challenge them. Darwin's theory of evolution is also an attempt to explain the evolution of life and its forms from lifeless matter without the intervention of Allah. So what's really interesting is that When people talk about the evolution of life, we look at Adam salam, and the Quran tells us that Adam was clay. And until the breath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was breathed into him, he was not a living animate being. And it is that breath, it is that ruh, it is that spirit that all of us want to know. And that spirit that we want to nurture because it is that spirit from where we get in touch with our fitra, our natural state, our inclination toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are the leading Darwinists of the century? One of the leading Darwinists of the century, Sir Aldous Huxley, expressed this thought as follows. Darwinism removed the whole idea of God as the creator of organisms from the sphere of rational discussion. And this is a quote from the neck of the giraffe. <laughs> In this category, Shek, acts of worship are directed to other than God, and the reward for worshiping is sought from the creation instead of the Creator. So whenever people are calling upon graves or human beings 
or other things for anything, that is what they are doing. So Shirk Alibada has two main aspects. As Shirk Al Akbar, so you know Allahu Akbar for the new Muslims means Allah is the greatest or greatest, another word for greatest is major. So this is the major shirk. And then the shirk al asghar is the minor shirk. So I want you to know that there are minor shirks and major shirks. There are minor ways of making partners with Allah and there are major ways. This form of shirk, the major shirk, shirk al akbar occurs when any act of worship is directed to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It represents the most obvious form of idolatry which the prophets were specifically sent by Allah to call the masses of mankind away from. So in Surah 16 verse 36, and we certainly sent into every nation a messenger saying, worship Allah and avoid tahut. Tahut. I have a hard time with the agha. And among them were those whom Allah guided, and among them were those whom, upon whom error was deservedly decreed. So proceed through the earth and observe how was the end of the deniers. So those people who participate in this are deniers of truth. They are rebels against the law, subhanahu wa ta'ala, because they are making partners and association with that which is created, with that which created it. Tahut means anything which is worshipped along with Allah or instead of Allah. Love is a form of worship which in its perfection should only be directed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is why the scholars say and we find in ahadith that the greatest love is the love purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no love that compares to this love. Just like there's no love that compares to the love of Mawadda, the love that is mentioned in the marriage bond. This yearning, pining love that has a category all to itself. So the love for Allah, the love for the messenger of Allah is a category all to itself. The love for our spouse is another love all to itself. So there are different kinds of love. How is the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expressed in, la in Islam? Through total surrender to Allah, to total obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not the type of love which mankind naturally feels toward creation, toward parents, children, food, etc. So we hear people use the word love very loosely. I love lasagna, somebody might say. I love Dunkin' Donuts. I but it has nothing to do with the love that is this worshipping type of love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To direct that type of love towards Allah is to lower Allah to the level of Allah's creation, which is shirk in al asma wa sifat. Love that is worship is the total surrender of one's will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the prophets to tell the believers in Surah 3 verse 31, say, if you love Allah, follow me and Allah will love you. So this verse is worthy of deep tafakkur and tadabr, deep contemplation and recognition of the consequences of not understanding this knowledge. Say, if you love Allah, follow me. So how do I demonstrate my love of Allah? I follow the messenger of Allah. And if I do follow the messenger of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love me. What is the opposite of that? If I do not love Allah and I do not love the messenger of Allah and follow the messenger of Allah, then Allah will not love me. The Prophet ﷺ told his companions, none of you is a true believer until I become more beloved to him or her and his or her child, his or her father and the whole of mankind. And this is from Bukhari and Muslim. 
This is how much we are to love Allah and the Messenger of Allah. And this, of course, even though it's the inappropriate character, adab, manners, etiquettes of a Muslim, that when cartoons were made of the Messenger of Allah, people became unraveled because they loved the Messenger of Allah. Love for the Prophet وسلم, is not based on his humanity, but on the divine origin of his message. And I'll remind you that this is the same message that came with Adam a.s. The message of all the 125,000 messengers was that there's one God. Thou shalt have no other gods before thee. Thou shalt not worship any graven images. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul, and lean not to thine own understanding. Like the love of Allah, it is also expressed by total obedience to His commands. In Surah 4 verse 80, he or she who obeys the messenger has obeyed Allah. In Surah 3 verse 32, say, obey Allah and the messenger. Sometimes I hear people say, ah, oh, that's just a sunnah. That's just a sunnah. Now, yes, they're not fogged. They're not obligatory, every single sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. But look at how we should respect them. If we choose not to practice a particular tradition of the Messenger of Allah, we should never refer to it as just a sunnah. How can we say just a sunnah and look at these verses that says he or she who has obeyed the messenger has obeyed Allah? Thus we know that there are many blessings when we do something that the messenger of Allah did. If we don't do it, we will not be punished. But if we do it, we will be rewarded. If we avoid it, we'll be rewarded. If we do it, we will be punished. If one allows the love of anything or anyone to come between him or herself and Allah, then he or she has worshipped that thing. Money and one's nafs, one's desires, can become God. And we can see how people will so desire a created thing that they will even kill for it. So if we look at Cain and Abel, two brothers, they were jealous over a very beautiful woman. And so one brother killed the other one out of desire. This is like worship, folks. Some people will kill themselves in this dunya amassing great wealth. They will work 16 hours a day. They will have a huge bank account and they will die never getting to use any of it because they just worship the act of money. I want as much money as I can get. The Messenger of Allah said, if a man has one mountain of gold, he will want another one. There's nothing wrong with wealth, but if you worship it, there's a problem. There's nothing wrong with having a beautiful wife or husband, but if you worship them, it's a problem. Our devotion must only be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet ﷺ said, the worshipper of the dirham, which is the currency in Arabia, the time of the Messenger of Allah, will always, Sallallahu will always be miserable. So this, remember, this is this love of, it's kind of a devotion. This love that is like you worship something. You adore something. And these are words that should be used specific to the Messenger of Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We love Allah and we love His Messenger and we are told to do that. In Surah 25 verse 43, Have you seen the one who takes as his or her God his or her own desires? So here is the proof for the one about desires. People will kill themselves to have a mansion that is bigger than their neighbor's. They will kill themselves to have the biggest house. 
the most fancy Lamborghini or whatever you want to substitute for fill in the blank. But they will sell out for this particular thing, this created thing. Much emphasis must be placed on the evils of shirk and ibadah, shirk and worship, because it contradicts the very purpose of creation. So we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah 51 and verse 56, and I did not create the jinn and mankind except, or I created the jinn and mankind for naught except to worship me, to love me, to be fully devoted to me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Major shirk represents the greatest act of rebellion against the Lord of the universe and it is the ultimate sin. It is a sin so great that it virtually cancels out all good a person may do and guarantees its perpetrator internal damnation in hell. False religion is based primarily on this form of shirk. Now what's really interesting is if we look at this you will often hear people really, really talk about the sin of adultery. Oh, the sin of adultery, the sin of adultery. And listen to how people project it. But riba is 70 times worse than the sin of adultery. But do we think about that? And if riba is 70 times worse than the sin of adultery, then what is the sin of shirk? Yet we fail to, you don't hear people talk a lot about the unforgivable sin of shirk. As a matter of fact, when I often talk to people, tell me what you know about shirk, they just look at me like, well, it's making partners with Allah. Can you tell me more? And they really don't grasp it. it and we're deluded because our focus about great sins are often riba, adultery, murder. And there's a competition about who can prove who, which sin is the greatest. And that shirk is rarely mentioned. A man-made system in one way or another invite their followers to worship, to the worship of creation. Christians are called upon to pray to a man. They are taught that if you don't pray in the name of Jesus, your prayer will not be accepted. So at the end of every prayer, they say, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Or in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's what they say. And that man, of course, is the prophet of God, Isa alayhi salam, that they actually claim to be God incarnate. Catholics among Christians pray to Mary as the mother of God. As a matter of fact, if you live in New York among a lot of Catholics and something happens, they'll say, oh, Jesus, Mary, Mother of God. This, they say it like often. And of course, they say prayers to Mary, the Mother of God, a human being, a perfect human being. They also pray to angels like the angel Michael who's actually honored September the 29th as St. Michael's Day. There's actually a day and they celebrate this saint. Who do we celebrate in Islam? We celebrate Allah. This is why many believers teach that celebrating the birthday of the Prophet ﷺ is a bidda. And it is a bidda in the terms that the companions did not have a birthday cake and celebrate the Prophet's birthday. I'm not speaking about humans on this dimension celebrating birthdays. I'm talking about how easy it is to participate in shirk when the Christians celebrate Jesus' birthday and there's no way that Jesus could have been born the 25th of December and you can do all the research you want to about that. Um, but they do. And that's why we have to be very careful when people are celebrating the birthday of the Messenger of Allah. They must know that this was not of the religion. We may honor that it's the celebration, but it is not from the rightly guided companions at all. So you just need to know that. Muslims whose acts of worship fall into this category of shirk are those who pray to Prophet Muhammad وسلم, or to mystics believing they can answer their prayers. 
and look at how this is mentioned in the Holy Quran. Say, have you considered if there came to you the punishment of Allah or there came to you the hour, is it other than Allah you would invoke if you should be truthful? So on that day when there is no shade except by the shah, the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, are you going to call on those people that you prayed to? Those people that went to Hajj, are they going to call on the graves that they prayed to? And it's very clear in the Quran. It's not any, even ambiguous. And yet people, I see it all the time. People involving themselves in shirk. And it's simply because of ignorance. Not ignorance in a derogatory manner, but just not knowing. And it hurts Allah. If you want to talk about sort of a figurative way of breaking the heart of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is that act. The ultimate act. Mahmud ibn Lubayd reported Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, The thing I fear for you the most is ash-shirk al asqar Minor shirk. And that's supposed to be shirk, not shirk. The companions asked, Oh, Messenger of Allah, what is minor shirk? He replied, Ariya, showing off. For verily Allah will say on the day of resurrection when people are receiving their rewards, go to those to whom you were showing off in the material world and see if you can find any reward from them. So I do struggle, may Allah help me here, I struggle sometimes with the ideology of Muslim comedians. Allahu alam. I don't know. Allah knows best. But this is very clear that showing off is an act of shirk. You're trying to get people to worship you. Look at me. I am so funny. Mahmud ibn Labayid also said the Prophet ﷺ came out and announced, O people, be aware of secret shirk. The people ask, O Messenger of Allah, what is secret shirk? He replied, when a man or woman gets up to pray and strives to beautify his or her prayer because people are looking at him or her, that is secret shirk. If I am beautifying my prayer solely for the sake of Allah, alhamdulillah. But if I'm getting up there so that people can say, MashaAllah, is it his tajweed just beautiful? But I don't ever have to worry about that one. Riya is the practice of performing any of the various forms of worship in order to be seen and praised by people. This is why in the authentic ahadith, if someone desires to be an imam, they are immediately disqualified. And this is authentic ahadith. One young man wanted to be an imam, and because he wanted to be an imam, the Messenger of Allah said he can't be an imam. So we have to know why we do what we do. And we have to fear Allah in doing what we're doing for the sake of Allah, and pray and ask Allah to protect us from showing off. This sin destroys all the benefits that lie in righteous deeds and brings on the one who commits it a serious punishment. It is particularly dangerous because it is natural for men and women to desire and enjoy the praise of their fellow men and women. And it's interesting because one of the so-called love languages in the modern world is words of affirmation. I have to be praised to survive. And there are people that live to be praised. They, they struggle to get people to praise them, to recognize them. Not to recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I know that this is hard. It's hard to take this stuff. It's hard to look at this stuff. Because showing off is such a part of the world. I want to show them my new home so I have a housewarming I want to show them this and I want to show them that the thing that we want to show people the most is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the gift of being called to Islam
doing religious acts to impress people or in order to be praised by them is therefore an evil which deserves being most cautious. This danger is really significant to the believers whose goal is to make all of their acts, of their lives, righteous acts, dedicated to Allah alone. The likelihood that knowledgeable believers would commit Ashaq al-Akbar is small, but its pitfalls are very obvious if you have the right knowledge. But for true believers like everyone else, the chance of committing riya is great because it is so hidden. It only involves a simple act of challenging one's intention. And it is the same way that to go from the alam al dunya to the alam al shahada, to go from the world of what is seen to the world of what is unseen is simply an intention. I want to do this for the sake of Allah. And that takes you from the world as low as you can go to as high as you want to go. You can elevate yourself to become like the angels. This is available. People are always trying to convince me, Imam Sykes, we're just humans. You ask too much of your students. You expect too much. You set the bar too high. I'm just setting the bar where Allah set it. That if I surrender myself and I purify myself, I want to be like the angels. The motivating forces behind it are also very strong since it comes from men and women's inner nature. If you see a child, children love to be praised and they need that as part of their development. But as we mature spiritually, we become aware that praise can be very dangerous. And we look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said about it and we reflect on that so that we protect our souls from the danger of that. Ibn Abbas alluded to this reality when he said, Sherak is more hidden than a black ant creeping on a black stone in the middle of a moonless night. And this is how subtle Sherak is, folks. You're not going to see a black ant on a black stone on a moonless night. And there's so much we don't see about Sherak. Thus, I'm teaching this class. And people are unfortunately bored by it sometimes. And there is no more valuable information for you as a Muslim than this information. Great care has to be taken to ensure that one's intentions begin pure and remain pure whatever righteous deeds are being done. In order to ensure this, the saying of Allah's name is enjoined in Islam before all acts of importance. So you will see Muslims before they go for a job interview, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Before they eat the food that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created for them, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The companions used to go to the bathroom and they used to thank Allah for removing the toxins from their body when they used the bathroom. So that people were always remembering and recollecting Allah. That's how alive Allah was in their heart. A series of dua, informal prayers, non-obligatory prayers, have also been prescribed by the Prophet ﷺ before and after the natural habits like eating, drinking, sleeping, cohabiting, and even going to the toilet in order to turn these everyday habits into acts of worship. A simple dua changes a worldly practice, behavior, into a spiritual one. And this is why if you don't have a copy of Fortress of the Muslim, I highly recommend that you get one. We have them available in our bookstore. Everybody should have one in their car. Everybody should learn these du'a, should know these du'a. And I don't know them all. But I take my little book and I have them highlighted and I go through them. When you get in the car, Bismillahi tawakaltu ala lehi wa la hawla wa la quwata ila billah. 
You make your journey a spiritual one. This awareness is called taqwa, which ultimately ensures that intentions remain pure. The Prophet ﷺ also provided protection against the inedible acts of shirk by teaching certain specific prayers which may be said any time. Abu Musa said, one day Allah's Messenger ﷺ delivered a sermon saying, O people, fear shirk. For it is more hidden in the creeping of an, than the creeping of an ant. Those whom Allah wished ask, and how do we avoid it when it is more hidden than a creeping of an ant? O Messenger of Allah. He replied saying, and I will read the English version, O Allah, we seek refuge in you from knowingly committing shirk with you. And we ask your forgiveness for what we do not know. This is a prayer that we should say every day and a prayer that I had not been saying. I'd forgotten this. But it is a prayer, the prayer perhaps that we should pray the most outside of the obligatory prayers. Oh Allah, protect me from this most heinous crime to associate anything with you. In Surah 5156, and I did not create the jinn and mankind except to worship me. This is the ultimate objective of jinn, mankind, and all creation. The very reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. This verse. illuminates the obligation of Tawheed for all of Allah's creation. The innermost purpose of the creation of all rational beings is their cognition of the existence of Allah and hence their conscious willingness to conform their existence to whatever they may perceive of Allah's will and plan. And it is this twofold concept of cognition and willingness that gives the deepest meaning to what the Quran describes as worship, ibadah. So it is, it is my humble prayer that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open our heart, lift the veils of our heart, help us to empty any darkness that's there, any ignorance that's there, and that Allah would open our hearts to receive this vital information. That we could truly, truly know what Tawheed is and truly, truly know what Shirk is. I want you to know that if I said anything today that was contrary to the truth of Islam, it came from my own nafs and I ask you to forgive me. If I said anything that was correct today, all the glory and all the praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I love you all for the sake of Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.